So that's the beginning of a series of lectures on demography. And demography is the study of three things, births, deaths, and migration. In other words, demographers study like how populations change or population dynamics. And for a population to change, it can only do so in three ways. People can be born, people can die, or people can move. So if people are born, it changes the population dynamics or the number of people in a country. If many people are born, the population grows. If not many people are born, the population shrinks. People can die. The dying of people, the death rate, also has implications for population dynamics. The more people die, the smaller the population. And then people can move. People can migrate. And people can either migrate away from a place. So if people migrate away from your country, your population size is going to shrink. And people can move to your country, in which case your population size may increase. These three things, births, deaths, and migration, tell us a huge amount about societies. And so um, demographers sort of focus in some ways quite narrowly on just three variables, fertility, mortality, and migration. But through those three variables can tell us an enormous amount about a society. So, you know, um, this may seem like uh, something kind of dull and boring, but it's not. It's actually a really interesting thing. Um, it's one of the few social science disciplines that can make decently good predictions. So uh, an example of this is like the baby boom generation. We knew that all those children were born and that allowed us to predict a lot of things into the future because we knew what their life course was gonna be. We had a good sense of what the course of their life was likely to be. And given that we have a lot of people that were born at one period in time, we knew that a lot of those people would be working at another period of time. A lot of them would be having children at another period of time. And a lot of them are retiring right now. And that tell, we can predict a lot because of it. Birth, sex, birth involves sex and moving and dying. They're part of everybody's lives. Um, and so this makes them kind of inherently interesting. And um, a population explosion has happened recently and it has had serious social effects, but we're also beginning to see a population uh, a slowing out of this process, kind of population potentially, population decline in some parts of the world. And that's also gonna have serious effects. I began this series of lectures by showing you this slide and it's an incredibly important slide for the way that I think about sociology. Um, and it, but it's also really important for just thinking about you know, the world um, uh, in, in, in general. And I'll, I'll um, uh, um, uh, make this bigger just for you all to see. You know, this tells us about world population growth in through history. And we see how you know, it took a lot of time for us to reach 1 billion people um, until about 1800 and that we've been adding a billion people very quickly. And as you'll know, um, the, 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 the slide predicts the future of the tailing off. That future, we don't really know what it's gonna be. Um, but this slide is suggesting just how many people there are in the world now as compared to only 300 years ago, tells us something huge about the transformation of populations. So, um, with this, uh, the effects of that population explosion have been environmental degradation and resource depletion. So the environmental crisis that we are facing as a world today is partially a consequence of that population explosion. It leads to the formation of new kinds of governments and economies, as well as pressures on those governments and economies. It has been associated with the emergence of entire new fields of study, like sociology, demography, economics, political science, anthropology. And it's part of a transformation of our social lives, of productive processes like industrialization and the industrialization of farming, the decline of rural life. And it's changed, as we've said so many times in these lectures, the structure of our social ties, or how we're tied to other people has fundamentally transformed as there are more people around. There is a central question of causality with this graph, which is, is it the case that the rise in population produced all of these outcomes? Like, you know, the rise in population led to the generation of capitalism, 
or if the emergence of capitalism allowed for the explosion of population. And it's not really clear what the answer to that is. In the rest of this lecture, I'm going to start going through the different um, uh, 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 approaches that demographers take. And the first is fertility. And fertility is, I mean, the first just from my, how I'm ordering. Um, uh, fertility, fertility refers to the number of births that occur in a population. And it refers to the number of births per woman. And so a fertility rate of 2.1 means that each woman in the population has on average 2.1 children. Replacement fertility, which is the number of people who need to be born in order for us to completely replace our society, has to be something above 2.0. Why? Well, fertility, insofar as it's counted by children per woman, is really children, women need to have two children to reproduce themselves and a man that they've partnered with. And um, some people die before they have their own children. Some people never have their own children. Um, and so uh, the fertility rate needs to be above two to have a uh, replacement. And in many societies today, the fertility rate has declined below two. So in the United States, for example, the, the fertility rate has declined before two. And that means that we can expect over um, the next generation for the US population to decline in size. Um, and that's gonna have big impacts on us. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the world population will decline in size because other nations have higher fertility rates. And one of the ways to deal with the decline in the fertility rate in the United States is through migration, is to encourage migration to the United States. If we don't do that, we can expect that our society will get smaller and there will be economic and social consequences to that. Now, what affects fertility? So why is it that fertility rates um, uh, are the way they are? Um, the first is fecundity, which is the physiological ability to have children. Um, the second is sex and the possibility of sexual, sexual union. So if it's not possible to form a sexual union, you won't have fertility. And the third is the availability of um, uh, birth control. Fecundity in this um, definition is the ability to have intercourse, the ability to conceive, and the ability to carry a pregnancy to term. So if you can't form a sexual partnership, you're not going to have children. If you can't conceive children, you're not going to have children. And if you're unable to carry a pregnancy to term, this could be because of poor maternal health, um, you won't have children. The most important factors here are the proportion of women who are in a sexual union, the percentage of women who are using contraception, the proportion of women who are infecund, who are in, incapable of uh, having intercourse, conceiving, or carrying a pregnancy to term, and the level of induced abortion. So, you know, Europe has been experiencing a decline in its birth rate. Um, and Jessica Brown, uh, a scholar in, in um, uh, uh, Texas, did a, a study of the discourse of uh, England um, uh, about the decline in native-born women's birth rates, meaning white women's birth rates, and exposed a moral panic around this, a moral panic about the decline in women's birth rates. And um, uh, uh, this decline was in part, this moral panic, excuse me, about the decline in women's birth weights uh, was really a panic about the transformation of English society. So a panic about how immigration um, uh, was the way that England was going to continue to, to grow or have a population and that immigrants were likely to be having more children than native born white English people and that English society was changing. And you know there was this view that people, um, because they had issues with immigrants, um, that England was becoming, quote unquote, less English, which really meant less white, um, as immigrants were beginning to reproduce more of the nation. And um, uh, there are a bunch of social commentators that Jessica Brown highlighted as putting enormous pressures on white women to try and have more children in order to preserve the nation. Now, this is beginning to happen also in the United States. We're in the earliest phases of this, but it's likely to see much more of this. There's anxiety about 
you know, basically a white supremacist view that what defines the United States is whiteness and that the decline in the white birth rate is a decline in the nation. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, um, the birth rate in the United States uh, has used to be quite high. So in the 19th century, the fertility rate was more than seven. So the average woman had seven children, but it declined until the baby boom and is now below two. So in 2007, the birth rate was 2.12, which was basically replacement fertility. But in 2020, the fertility rate is 1.77. And that means that fewer and fewer women are having two children. Um, and so the likelihood that uh, the United States will replace itself through its fertility processes is very low. So over the next 40 years, we'll see um, a huge decline in this. If we compare different nations, rich and poor nations, we find that they have different birth rates. Mortality rates differ, um, as does the dependency on children for work for in, in later life uh, support. And that's part of the reason why, that is poor people may rely upon um, their children to help them later in life, especially absent a social net. But we'll talk more about the economics of this in a little bit. Um, Many ethnic and racial minorities have higher fertility rates than native born whites. Um, and we might ask why that is. Um, uh, first of all, I'll note that it's not always true. Japanese and Chinese Americans have lower fertility rates than whites. So Japanese and Chinese Americans are more likely to have smaller families. But other racial and ethnic groups, so other Asians um, who aren't Japanese and Chinese, and uh, African immigrants, um, uh, Hispanic immigrants, Latino immigrants. Um, uh, uh, and part of the reason is that immigrants bring homeland practices with them. So insofar as immigrants are migrating from other countries, they bring a series of practices from those countries with them. And different religious beliefs and cultural traditions will influence people's fertility rates. The other reason is socioeconomic status. Immigrants tend to be poorer than the country on, as a whole. And insofar as immigrants are poor, we know that poorer people have slightly higher fertility rates. So, but another thing that we found is that as racial and ethnic groups and immigrant groups assimilate, that is, as the generations accrue, their fertility rate declines. Um, the largest variable explaining this difference, though, is socioeconomic status. Finally, in almost all cases, as income increases, fertility declines. And the relationship between fertility and socioeconomic status is a very powerful tool for socio socio sociological analysis. Unlike other things, fertility is pretty clear. It's a fairly knowable indicator, especially within the Western world, which is to say that when children are born, we actually have data on and so this provides us a very, very critically important tool. At discrete moments, which just means at different periods in time, the relationship between income and fertility can be tricky. People may decide to either hold off on having children during times of economic uncertainty, or people can decide to have more children during some of those time periods. So what does that mean? Well, like if say the labor market is really bad, it might be a good time to have children because you know, the cost of having a child on your work is not gonna be as great if labor markets aren't great. You're not giving up on economic growth by having children. Because parents know that like, by having children, you're gonna to have to do things to lower the amount that you're working. And so under bad labor market conditions, some parents may choose to have kids because their economic opportunities aren't that great anyway. But at others at times, there may be decisions that families make where they say, actually, I'm not gonna have kids right now because of the bad economic situation. Because like the, predict the future is not predictable. It's not a good time to bring a child into the world. But in the aggregate or overall, we find that income and fertility are positively correlated, meaning increases in income are associated with declines in fertility overall. 